Hey everyone, how's it going? Uh, I come to you with a book talk today, and I want to talk about the, ca the Evidence for God, The Case for the Existence of the Spiritual Dimension by Keith Ward. Keith Ward uh, is a professor emeritus at Oxford University. He is an Anglican pastor. He's written quite a few books on the subject of religion, as well as the in crossing between science and religion. So he certainly has uh, an impressive bibliography and seems to have qualifications, uh, although I have to say that it does surprise me that someone with the qualifications that he has could have written such a intellectually sloppy book as this is. Uh, yeah, so the title of the book is relatively self-explanatory. Uh, Keith Ward is kind of putting forth his own perspective, his own argument about why he believes that there is, as he called, as, as he calls it, a spiritual dimension to the world. That the world isn't purely material. And he often refers to the spiritual dimension, of course, as God, mostly because he comes from the perspective of a, a Christian. And something that I was on board with early in this book was the fact that he at least said that he wasn't going to be making kind of logical proofs of God. He wasn't going to be trying to sort of prove God's existence with arguments. Or, or logic or reason or scientific evidence or anything like that. Uh, he actually says uh, very early in the book that he takes a, a much different perspective. Uh, and so he, this is what he says on that subject. Uh, it should be clear that looking for evidence for God or for spirit or for spiritual reality is not going to be like looking for evidence for some exotic animal or for an invisible teapot. Looking for that sort of evidence is like looking for footprints or chewed leaves that will show an animal has been there. But a purely spiritual being does not leave footprints or chew leaves. And he says a little bit lower, uh, there can be evidence for spiritual things, but it will not be like evidence for physical objects. Even when physicists look for evidence for tiny subatomic particles that can never be observed, like quarks, they assume those particles are physical in some sense. The main and most important evidence for spirit will be evidence for the existence of non-physical supreme values. There is such evidence, but it is going to be very unlike evidence for electrons or quarks. So, it kind of says that his way of argumenting, ar arguing isn't going to be laying out data, laying out logical proofs, or anything like that. It's going to be kind of a, a bit more subjective, sort of arguing from your own subjective experience of the world. And, you know, he, he talks about art and our subjective experience of art and how we tend to find sort of transcendent experiences in art, and he claims that that is sort of evidence for a spiritual dimension, or at least that it's a necessary but not sufficient condition for the existence of a spiritual dimension. Uh, he looks at morality and how the fact that humans feel this compulsion towards morality is evidence for a spiritual dimension, I guess. Uh, just the impulse that we have toward morality is somehow, uh, you know, an evidence for, for God. Uh, and I think I think his first stumbling block is is that he has an unspoken assumption throughout the book, which is this assumption of dualism, this assumption that the mind is somehow separate from material reality. Uh, and he never says this that he believes this, but it's definitely implicit in a lot of what he says. And uh, one instance where that is uh, becomes very clear. It's actually towards the end of the book, uh, and he says, uh, and I quote, uh, Some neuroscientists suggest that such experiences are simply physical states of the brain without objective reality. As though what happens in the brain doesn't have objective reality, right? Thus implying that what happens in the brain, and from his perspective, is somehow, you know, not material. That, it, that there is such thing as a mind. Uh, and there's another piece of evidence of this earlier in the book. Um, He's actually quoting from Stephen Hawking, and he says, uh, so this is the quote from Stephen Hawking, uh, We human beings are ourselves mere collections of fundamental particles. And then Keith Ward goes on to say, that, that is a philosophical view if ever there was one. It is precisely what is usually called eliminative materialism. It reduces consciousness, feelings, and thoughts to nothing but complicated arrangements of physical particles, and thereby eliminates them from reality. Now again, why is the fact that the that the mind is reducible to physical particles, to neurons, neurotransmitters, or subatomic particles, or whatever piece of whatever level of physical matter you want to use? Why is it that 
reducing the mind to that, showing the fact that our subjective experience is just a physical experience in the brain. Why does why is that reductive? Why do people like Keith Ward and also, frankly, Marilyn Robinson, and also to be again quite frank, uh, Christian Wyman? Why do writers like this, who you, you know pretty much universally come from a religious perspective, assume that boiling down subjective experience to a physical experience is why do they see that as reductive? You know, why do they think that that's so? I don't know, why do they think that that somehow invalidates their own subjective experiences? To my mind, it doesn't invalidate anyone's subjective experience of anything to say that all that subjective experience happens in the brain and it's just a physical thing. Uh, it, it's just a way of explaining it, you know, when you explain the way that a fire happens through chemistry, you know, if a chemist were to explain that to you, that wouldn't, you know, that wouldn't devalue or invalidate your subjective a, a feel your subjective feeling that a fire is beautiful. You know, I mean, I personally find fire very beautiful. And hearing it explained in a very mechanistic way how that fire came out doesn't devalue my own subjective experience. And the fact that that subjective experience of the beauty of fire comes from a physical reality in my brain also doesn't, to my mind, reduce it at all. Uh, it's, again, just a way of explaining it. So a lot of his arguments are based on this assumption that the mind is separate from material reality. And that came out very early in that chapter about art and about morality, because he was essentially arguing that because our mind perceives this transcendence through art or and perceives this impulse towards morality, therefore that is evidence that there's a god influencing the mind or something like that. Uh, and so that, I think, is a huge problem. Another issue that I think I've touched on in what I've already said is that I think Keith Ward confuses a materialism and nihilism. So materialism is obviously belief that every all of our subjective experiences are able to be boiled down to physical reality, which is sort of which is definitely my perspective. Uh, but but that's different from nihilism, which is just that you believe in nothing, that you believe that there is no morality, nothing is right, nothing is wrong, everything goes, so on and so forth. And those are two different things. And he seems to believe that you cannot argue for morality without recourse to some kind of supernatural deity, which, again, I just don't agree with. You can make arguments based on just, you know, sort of physical reality for being a good person, I think. You know, it is in a lot of people's best interest for you to just be a decent person, uh, and you can make those arguments without recourse to a god or a soul or anything like that. So. There, there is there is this confusing of terms and this unspoken assumption of dualism in his book. And, you know, what, what the, but the, the one, the thing that I think I probably took most issue with is the circular reasoning, reasoning that I see in this book. You know, even though he starts the book out saying that he is not going to lay out, like, logical proofs or, you know, give scientific evidence for God, he does kind of end up doing that because he basically starts to talk about uh, he basically starts to try to make this argument that the universe shows a purpose, like suggest, like the universe in the way it's structured suggests that it has some sort of a purpose, that it's working towards some sort of an end, uh, which would suggest the existence of a god, in his mind at least. Uh, and he, at one point, leans in toward, I don't know if he necessarily names it, but he leans in towards this, you know, fine-tuning argument, this idea that uh, that 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 our universe is fine-tuned to create consciousness uh, and um, so this happens uh, somewhere near the middle of the book uh, he says uh, so uh, this is what he says uh, many basic laws and the values of forces like gravity and electric charge have have to be almost exactly what they are to produce a universe which is stable enough to develop carbon-based life forms like us very slight changes in the nuclear force or electric force would destroy even the possibility of intelligent life like ours and, I mean, this is a just-so story, you know, uh, the thing, the problem with this kind of an argument is that we only have the one universe to, to tell us about this sort of thing, whether our universe is fine-tuned. We, we have a, we, in, you know, statistical terms, we have an n of one, we have a sample size of one. And when you have only a sample size of one, and nothing to compare that one universe to, you can't really know if your universe is fine-tuned to produce consciousness. 
uh, because you don't have any, anything to compare it to. If we had, you know, 50 other universes that we could observe and we could confirm there was no consciousness there because of X, Y, Z reasons, then you could maybe, maybe make this argument. But with only one universe to look at, you cannot make that argument. Uh, and, and in any case, if, if even one part of your genetic code were changed, you would be, you would end up as a very different person, right? Like, just a little change in your, your gene makeup. If a different, you know, spermatozoa and egg had merged to create you in the womb, uh, you, if, if that, you know, if those two had been even slightly different from what they were, you would be a very different person. But that doesn't mean that you, as the person you are, are, like, fine-tuned by a divine being to be the way you are. It just means that it wasn't a different sperm or egg that created you. Uh, and so this argument is just, just makes no sense. And it's also highly ironic that he begins the book suggesting that he's not going to do what a lot of other people do when they try to argue for the existence of God. Uh, he's not going to try to do this, to actually find scientific evidence for God or something like that. Uh, and yet here he is kind of doing it. And, and on top of all of this are just the number of statements that he makes that he just offers no, no, uh, support for. He just kind of seems to say them as though you should just accept them b by his word. Uh, and I, I have only two examples for you, so don't worry, I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna go through all of them. But they both just happen to be, uh, on opposite pages from one another. So the first one is where he says, a widely accepted modern scientific view of the universe is that it is goal-directed, directed towards the emergence of consciousness, intelligence, and reason. No, no, no evidence for that. No, he doesn't cite anyone arguing that. He doesn't support that argument at all. He just sort of makes that statement and then moves on. Uh, and then on the very next page, uh, on the very, uh, yeah, on the very next page, he says, the universe has the developing structure it has in order that it might really realize such values as intelligent and creative freedom. Again, n nothing said to support it. And yeah, so I, I hope this video has attained some level of coherence. Uh, I don't think that this video was ever going to be super coherent because there's just a lot of problems in this book. And there was there was a lot more that I could have gone into. I feel like I could have made this video, you know, an hour long where I just dissect various statements that he makes in this book. Uh, but I didn't want it to be ungodly long. And I've also kind of been procrastinating on doing it because I knew it would be kind of hard. So this video is not all that coherent, then I apologize. I just wanted to get it out, but I did want to make it to some degree. I didn't want to just not do it. So uh, here it is. Uh, hopefully I, it, it turned out all right. Hopefully I will be able to edit, edit it into something that makes some kind of sense. But I will just say at the very end of this video that honestly, I, I, I grow more and more disillusioned with these arguments about whether or not God exists. You know, there are so many people who there are so many atheists, so many religious people who argue over whether or not God exists as though that's like the most important question that anyone can ask when it comes to religion. And really I find it to be a, a peripheral question. I find that logical, uh, not, not, that, not, not that God isn't important, but the existence of God seems like it, a peripheral question because most people I think who have religious faith don't necessarily have it because they've been like convinced through like logical arguments or anything like that or like scientific evidence i think it has a lot more to do again with just their subjective experience which is ironic because that's kind of what keith ward tries to say but then kind of just throws that in the trash bin as he goes along um and for for most people it's you know their experiences their their lived experience of the world that that matters much more than argumentation and i think that's true of atheists as well i don't think most people who become unbelievers or are unbelievers or have been unbelievers were necessarily convinced by some kind of, you know, logical argument or anything. They just kind of eventually realized that they that it didn't mean much to them, that the uh, idea of God just didn't mean much to them. And, you know, I, I will also just say that two other books that I read this month were um, My Bright Abyss, uh, Meditation of a Modern Believer by Christian Wyman, and What Are We Doing Here? Essays by Marilyn Robinson. Uh, in which these two people, who are both religious and who are both believers and both intensely smart, uh, just talk a lot about their own faith and their own approach to the universe through faith and through through their belief, their faith in God. And you know, I find that just hearing about that infinitely more compelling than having someone try to shove God, God down my throat. You know, uh, you know, it makes God. It makes me kind of see 
why someone would have faith much more clearly than a book like this. You know, just looking at people approach the world through faith makes me understand it much more than, again, this kind of a book. So anyway, I, I've kind of repeated myself. I've gone on for longer than I meant to. I will leave it at that. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, and uh, anyway, I will leave it at that. Bye, guys.